I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to the Bigfoot Breakdown. Today we're going to do the Bauman story, folks, and that's from Theodore Roosevelt's book, Wilderness Hunter, published in 1891 or two, I believe. I've got a copy of it around the house somewhere, but um, ah, sorry. Out of breath, I ran up the stairs. Um, this is a story that's actually, I think there's lots of misinformation that gets put out. People hear Teddy Roosevelt in this story, and you see artwork done of, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, with a machine gun shooting the Bigfoot and stuff like that. Teddy Roosevelt had nothing to do with this subject. <laughs> the misconception is that he was he was involved in this, you know, and what happened was, if you've ever read, I've read a couple of biographies about Roosevelt, and a really interesting guy, you know, but he was he was basically kind of a weakling as a child, and uh, not real good health, so he wanted, you know, to kind of pull himself up by the bootstrap. So what he decided to do when he was a young man was to go out into the western part of the country and, and you know, kind of toughen himself up. And in the course of all that, he would meet a lot of people. And he would jot down, you know, stories, and his books are full of those stories that he collected out west. Uh, in the book Wilderness Hunter, and uh, and there was another one. It's uh, Tales of a Ranchman or something like that. But anyhow, it's only it's only a, a three or four page story. And uh, what it was was Roosevelt during one of these trips out west. Uh, he met this guy named Bauman, and you know it starts off. Uh, he starts off with this story. He says, frontiersmen are, are are not, as a rule, apt to be very superstitious. They lead lives that are too hard and practical, have too little imagination, and think spiritual or supernatural. He says, I've heard but a few ghost stories while living on the frontier, and those few were of a very a very perfectly commonplace type. So they were kind of, you know, it, it was, he's saying basically, you know, he heard these stories, but to him it was more mundane than what the person telling the story was. He says, I, but I once listened to a goblin story, which rather impressed me. It was told by a grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter named Bauman, who was born and lived past his life on the frontier. And he said he must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale. So how many times have we heard that with Bigfoot witnesses, where, you know, you can tell they had a really genuine encounter because you could hear the, vo uh, the fear in their voices. I know you guys have heard that Lots before. Lots of times. Oh, well, yeah. I think we've, we've all experienced it, too. Yes, yes, very much so. I, if you've had that experience, it never leaves you. It shakes you. And every time you relive it, you relive the fear that you experienced in those moments. Um, so, you know, in, in this chapter, in this uh, paragraph, you know, Bauman's kind of, or Bauman, to Roosevelt's kind of, he's kind of making excuses why maybe this guy believed the things that he did because of his ancestry um, like he says, um, he was of German ancestry and in childhood had doubtless been saturated with all kinds of ghost and goblin lore. Well, when you go to Europe, goblins and trolls were Sasquatches. That's, that's exactly where those terms came from. So, um, you know, now whether Bauman believed that stuff or not, we don't know. And the story, because he said he was an old man and, and the book was published, like I said, 1891 or 92, I can't remember which. Uh, and then, and and, you know, obviously Roosevelt wrote the book probably a year or two, three years prior to that publication date. And when he met Bauman, Bauman was an old man. So we could presume, uh, I think rightly so, that Bauman was probably a young man when this occurred. I think he, he mentions this or something to that effect. Yeah, he says Bauman was still a young man. Um, so you could speculate maybe around 1860 this probably happened. Um so he's he goes on, he says, um, so that many fearsome superstitions were latent in his mind. Now, and again, he's, he's speculating whether the old man had superstitions or not. He doesn't know, but he's speculating, I guess, trying to make, you know, some kind of explanation for the story that he's about to tell. 
Um, he said, besides, he knew well the stories told by the Indian medicine men in their winter camps of snow walkers. Now, that's one I'm not familiar with, a snow walker. Uh, and specters and lonely formless evil beings that haunt the forest depths and dog and waylay the lonely wanderer who after nightfall passes through regions where they lurk it may have been and it may be that when overcome by the horror of the fate that befell his friend and when oppressed by the awful dread of the unknown he grew to attribute both at the time and in remembrance weird and elf tra- elfin traits um, to what was merely some abnormally weird, wicked, wild beast. Uh, whether this was so or not, no man can say. Well, okay, in, out in the West, what other beast could there have been other than a bear, maybe? Right? Uh, so right, right. Right. So, I mean, y- you know, Bauman lived his whole life on the frontier. He would have been extremely familiar with all animal life out there. The guy was a hunter and trapper. Um, so what wigged him out so much? I mean, I, I don't think even if, even if a bear would have come in and torn his friend to pieces, uh, that it would have frightened him to that level as the story goes on. He says, when the event occurred, Bauman was still a young man and was trapping with a partner among the mountains, dividing the forks of the salmon from the head of the Wisdom River. And this is in Northwestern Montana. Uh, not having had much luck, he and his partner determined to go up into a particularly wild and lonely pass through which it ran stream, uh, ran a small stream said to contain many beaver. The pass had an evil reputation because the year before a solitary hunter who had wandered into it was there slain by a wild beast. The half eaten remains being afterwards found by some mining prospectors who had passed his camp only the night before. Of course, at this point, now that could have been anything. Uh, let's see. Let me go on here. You know, I suppose, oops, wrong, wrong mouse. I got two computers going here. So, Okay. So the memory of this event, however, weighed very lightly with the two trappers. So they didn't think much of the event. Who were as adventurous and as hardy as others of their kind. And and I think, you know, living on a frontier back in those times, you had to be pretty tough. You know, dealing with, you know, hostile natives and, and all kinds of animal life who weren't used to people other than humans. So they had to deal with all those. And, of course, weather and all sorts of harsh conditions. So... Um, you know, they were determined to go make some money off trapping. So, uh, that's where they went. They took, they took their lean, uh, two lean mountain ponies and they hobbled them in a beaver, open beaver meadow because where they were going up this mountain was too rocky for the horses. Apparently, um, they, uh, they went, they were in for, they hiked in there about four hours. They reached a little open glade where they concluded to camp and signs of game were plentiful. There was still about an hour of daylight left, and after building a brush lean-to and throwing down and opening their packs, they started upstream. The country was very dense and hard to travel through, um, as there was much down timber. And you get up in those mountainous areas in the wintertime, there's a lot of windfalls, and uh, they, they are very difficult areas to go through. So he goes on, uh, although here and there uh, the somber woodland was broken by small glades, of mountain grass. At dusk, they reached their camp. In the glade was uh, pitched. Oh, oh, okay. I'm kind of getting past here. Okay. Let's see. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, excuse me, just a moment. <coughs> Okay, so it was about dusk when they were getting back to their camp. Um, and they were talking about <clears throat> kind of the layout. On one side was a little stream, beyond which rose a steep mountain slope covered with, covered with unbroken growth of evergreen forest. <clears throat> okay, they were surprised to find that during their absence, something, apparently a bear, had visited camp, <clears throat> had rummaged around their things, scattering the contents of their packs, and in sheer wantonness, destroying their lean-to. The footprints were quite plain. At first, they paid no particular heed to them, busying themselves with rebuilding the lean-to, laying out their beds and stores and lighting a fire. So I, I suppose, you know, I figured out a bear came in, was rummaging through our stuff, no biggie, put their things back, rebuilt the lean-to. <clears throat> While Bowman was making supper, 
It already being dark, his companion began to examine the tracks more closely, and soon took a brand from, uh, from the fire to follow him, where the intruder walked along the game trail after leaving camp. Uh, when the brand flickered out, he returned and took another, repeating inspection of the footprints very closely. He came back to the fire and stood by it for a minute or two, peering out into the darkness, and suddenly remarked, Bauman, that bear's been walking on two legs. Bauman laughed at this, but his partner insisted that he was right, and upon examining the tracks again with the torch, they certainly did seem to be made by but two fo- paws or feet. And it's interesting they mention that paws or feet, like they weren't sure. Uh, however, it was too dark to make sure, after discussing whether the footprints could have possibly been those of a human being, and coming to the conclusion that they couldn't be, the two men rolled up in their blankets and went to sleep under the lean-to. So, at this point, they're probably still thinking bear. Uh, okay, so at midnight, Bauman was awakened by some noise. He sat up in his blankets. As he did so, his nostrils, nostrils were struck by a wild beast odor. Then he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Grasping his rifle, he fired at the, fired at the vague, threatening shadow, but must have missed, for immediately afterwards he heard the smashing of underwood as the thing, whatever it was, rushed off in, into the impenetrable blackness of the forest in the night. That always creeped me out, that part. <laughs> um, after, right. this, after this, the two men slept but little, sitting up by the rekindled fire, but they heard nothing more. In the morning, they started out <clears throat> to look at a few of the traps they had set the previous evening and put out new ones. By an unspoken agreement, they kept together all day, returning to camp afterwards, uh, towards evening. On returning, they saw, hardly to their astonishment, that the lean-to had again been torn down. The visitor, the visitor, the preceding day, had returned, and in wanton malice had tossed about their camp kit bedding and destroyed the shanty. The ground was marked up by its tracks. On leaving camp, it had gone along soft earth by the brook, where the footprints were as plain as if on snow. After careful scrutiny of the trail, it certainly did to seem, or it certainly did seem as if whatever the thing was, it had walked off on but two legs. Now, <clears throat> certainly at this point, it's not a bear, because bears don't walk around on two legs. Uh, the men, thoroughly uneasy, gathered a great heap of logs and kept up a roaring fire throughout the night. I think I would have done that too. Uh, one or the other sitting on guard most of the time. About midnight, the thing came down through the forest pa- uh, across the uh, opposite across the brook and stayed there on a hillside for nearly an hour. They could hear it. They could hear the branches crackle. Sorry about that. My reading is not that great. Um, it moved about several times, uttering a harsh, grating, long, long-drawn moan, a particularly sinister sound. Yet it didn't venture near the fire. <clears throat> you know that kind of reminds me back of when we did the uh, Clark Ranch situation we had you know we built that fire up as big as we could and the creatures wouldn't come in you know they wouldn't come into the firelight uh it kept them at bay it moved it moved about and several times okay i did read that okay in the morning the two trappers after discussing the strange events of the last 36 hours decided they would shoulder their packs and leave the valley that afternoon <clears throat> they were more ready to do this in spite of seeing a good deal of game sign uh, and they'd caught very little fur However, it was necessary to first go along the line of their traps and gather them, and this they started to do. All morning, they kept together, picking up trap after trap, each one being empty. On first leaving the camp, they had a disagreeable sensation of being followed. How, we, how many times have we heard that before? Um, in the dense spruce thickets, they occasionally heard a branch snap uh, after they had passed uh, the location. And now and then, there was a slight rustle noises among the small pines to one side of them you know of course we we hear this all the time from people where they they're being followed and they hear these exact kinds of things um so at noon they were back within a couple miles of camp in the high bright sunlight their fear seemed absurd to the two men accustomed accustomed as they were through long years of lonely wandering in the wilderness to face every kind of danger first uh every kind of danger from man brute or element there were still three beaver traps to collect from a little pond in a wide ravine nearby bauman volunteered to gather these and bring them in while his companion went on and made ready the packs on reaching the pond bauman found 
three beaver traps, or three beavers in the traps, one of which had been pulled loose and carried into the beaver house. It took several hours in securing and preparing the beaver, um, and when he started homewards, he marked with some uneasiness how low the sun was getting. As he hurried towards camp under the small trees, the silence and desolation of the forest weighed on him. His feet made no sound on the pine needles, and the slanting sun rays striking along uh, the straight trunks made gray twilight in which objects in the distance glimmered indistinctly. There was nothing to break the gloomy stillness uh, <clears throat> when there was no breeze, always broods. So he's just giving a description of how gloomy the forest looks. Um, at last, when he came to the edge of the little glade where the camp lay, he shouted as he approached it, but got no answer to his call. The campfire had gone out, <clears throat> though the thin blue smoke was still curling upwards. Near it lay the packs, wrapped and arranged. At first, Bauman could see nobody, nor did he receive an answer to his call. Stepping forward, he again, he again shouted, and as he did, uh, did so his eye fell on the body of his friend, stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. Rushing forward, or rushing toward it, the horrified trapper found that the body was still warm, but the neck was broken, while there were four great fang marks on the throat. The, fo the footprints of the unknown beast creature printed the soft soil, told the whole story. The unfortunate man, having finished packing, had sat down on the spruce log with his back to the, or with his face to the fire, and his back to the dense woods, waiting for his companion. While thus waiting, his monstrous assailant, who must have been lurking in the woods, waited for a chance to catch one of the adventurers unprepared, came silently up from behind, was walking still on two legs, evidently unheard. It reached the man and broke his neck by wrenching his head back with its forepaws while while buried his teeth in his throat. It had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gambled around it in uncouth, ferocious flea, occasionally rolling over and over in it, and it fled back into the soundless depths of the woods. Bauman, utterly unnerved, and believing that the creature with which he had to deal was something either half-human or half-devil, some great goblin beast, he abandoned everything but his rifle, struck off at speed down the pass, not halting until he reached the beaver meadows where the pony, hobbled ponies were still grazing. Mounting, he rode onwards uh, through the night until beyond reach of pursuit. So that's that's the story that he wrote. Um, what do you guys think? Well, I think you see a lot of... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Chuck. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead, Force. Uh, well, I think we see a lot of common factors, uh, commonalities there, and uh, the, the the pacing, you know, in the woods, you know, staying hidden, but, uh, you know, walking alongside of them. I mean, Chuck's experienced that. Y'all have experienced that. Uh, I have never experienced that, but uh, <laughs> it, it's something I really don't care to experience. Uh, they, you know, and then coming up to the lean-to, uh, I mean, they have no problem coming in houses, cabins, or anything else. So I don't think that's an unusual behavior. Um, but they do seem to not light, light or a fire. So and most predators don't. So <laughs> they seem to have an innate fear of uh, fire. So I think it's it's a totally believable situation. The thing that I find very disturbing is the fact that uh, the animal, the Bigfoot, seemed to be totally exhilarated by the fact that he had killed this human. And we do see that in chimps, that uh, when they kill something, they all get up and swing their arms and kind of jump around and like they're all pleased, very pleased with themselves and uh, excited about having <clears throat> done it. So anyway, I think it's a totally believable account. Yeah, I think I think there's because there's so many common elements to other stories that we know about today in that one. I think that's why it resonates with people. Yes, and they would have had Bauman would not have. I don't think had the experience of having heard. I mean, yes, he might have. Well, no, I'm not going to say that he'd heard other accounts because he doesn't seem to. Uh, recognize that there were other accounts that he had heard about this. Well, and we know from our, our Native friends that a lot of Natives will not share that information with outsiders. 
Yeah. No, well, he, I think they probably got a lot of ridicule. Quite oh, probably. No, he probably, he probably did hear stories in, in, in the camps, but, you know, but, but that aside, they may not have talked about that particular thing because, as we know, that's very important in Native culture. So, um, you know, they wouldn't share that kind of information with somebody that's, you know, especially a, a white man. Well, yeah, but you say that, but he doesn't actually make any acknowledgement that he had ever heard anything like no, that. No, exactly. He was totally, his, un, uh, yeah, he was totally unfamiliar with it. Yeah. Chuck, so, what do you think? So I, 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 this is one of the stories that actually kind of stirred my interest in the whole subject matter. And, um, I, the, this story actually fascinated me when I was young and, um, you know, I, I think it is believable. I think it is true. And I, I've got kind of a side note to it too. Um, I, uh, I heard a story and I can't remember where I heard the story from. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, that Teddy was actually a marshal or sheriff in Montana Territory uh, at one time. I don't, I don't recall reading that in his biography, but it's possible, I suppose. He was pretty young back then. And I, I actually saw a photograph, an old black and white photograph from, from those, those years of Teddy Roosevelt, um, White Earp, Doc Holliday, uh, Batheson, and there was, I think, a couple of the other Earps were there, too. And they were all sitting, like, at a saloon, and Teddy was there. They were all there. And supposedly, uh, from, from, from this photograph and from the idea of, of Teddy being a marshal or a sheriff in that day, they were all going to go out on a hunting trip. And uh, nobody really knows for sure, uh, the story I heard, what they were actually hunting for. But my, my whole idea, my, my mind clicked in and thought, if, if, if they believed in this story, um, did they go out and try to find and hunt one of these things? Well, you know, I mean, look in in his look book. Look at the gun. In his book, he look didn't. Look at the gunman. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't make a big deal of this story. It was it was one of the smaller stories. He wrote much longer stories about very mundane things that he you know right. that he experienced. This was almost a side note. Well. Think, think if the gunslingers that that were there in that photograph. Well, if, I mean, if that's legitimate, guys, though, because I, I don't. Yeah, re, I don't, if it's legitimate, I don't, I don't remember that from reading his biographies. I'd have to defer to somebody who's more actually Alan, who's our historian. He would probably know. It'd be interesting to see if that. I mean, I heard that story, and I actually I used to have that photograph, but I don't know what I did with it. Uh, of all those guys setting in front of a saloon uh they were all together including teddy teddy was there too and um i'm just wondering if if they went out on some kind of hunting trip looking for one of these things well that was that's what kind of amazed me that was that was never in any of the things that i know that he wrote or in his biography so like i said we we can have alan i can have alan check into that he's he's our historian so uh, but there's, you know, looking at the elements of the story, um, you know, obviously the two guys, they weren't too concerned about the hunter that had killed, been killed the previous year, probably thought it was a bear or a cougar or something. And I, I'm sure they thought, oh, there's two of us together. You know, we can take care of ourselves. This guy was by himself. Um, right. Then there's, you know, then there's the odor, you know, that woke, that Bauman encountered when he woke up. Then the creature was right there at the, the head or the opening of the lean-to, so... You know, very believable. The creature obviously waited for the two men to separate. And then, you know, it snuck up. If it was a bear, a bear's not going to sneak up on you without hearing it. Where this thing, obviously, it was walking on two legs. Um, and it snuck up silently behind the guy. And 
and you know depending on the variant of the creatures now i've heard of this before where you know they they bitten someone um and left fang marks the four four fang marks so you know that would be a very animal way of killing something grab by the head pull the head back and then bite them in the throat break their neck sure sure i, I believe the story and I, I believe that happened go ahead forrest it's definitely true well, i was gonna say who's to know he might have nodded off at the campfire too waiting for bowman to get back oh very true yeah very true if he was gone a long time and he said he was it took him extra time so well, yeah, okay. and we've all experienced the smell and everything like oh, that. Yeah. I mean, I have, Chuck yeah. has, I have. you have, Tom has. I, 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 every once in a while we hear people talk about, you know, uh, <clears throat> that they they smelt them before they saw them. So, right, right. Uh, you know, well, and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, there's safety in numbers. We always mm-hmm. say that, you know, <laughs> and and the fact that it waited till they separated, you know, that sur- shows a, smart. an extreme amount of intelligence yes. that uh, it would be, you know, doing that. And, I mean, even bears and cougars will do that, too. They know that once you separate, you know, it's just like separating one animal from a herd, and you remember, know, remember then uh, they can go after it. We've talked about that with people before, too, going out into the wilderness. If you're concerned about these creatures and your safety, there's safety in numbers. You know, it's a numbers game with them thing. It'll definitely throw them off if there's more than one person. Um, and then, and then the final, I guess the final note. Of course, you already went through it, and very, um, very good observation about how, you know, its behavior after it killed the man. You know, it was in glee and and kind of like what we talked about on campfire talk uh, yesterday with, you know. The, the video of the pig being torn in half in Australia where, you know, they just, and, and I've interviewed other people, you know, Bigfoot researchers uh, years ago in the Southeast where they, there was one, and I've talked about this before on the show, but uh, the guy's name is Mike. And he talked to me about uh, this one particular small community where one or more of these things had gone in there and just was killing all kinds of, not just wild animals, but uh, livestock it, it uh, in one case it killed a horse by biting through its spinal column, um, tore pigs in half, did all kinds of really brutal things. Didn't eat the animals, just killed them, and within close proximity to humans, almost like it wanted them to find the dead animals that were killed this way. So uh, these things got a vindictive streak. So <clears throat> you know we don't know. You know you never know what you're going to encounter out there. Well, guys, I think that's that's our coverage for the Bauman story. Um, I think we're all in agreement. We think it's a, a, it really happened. So, folks, what do you think out there? You know, let us know in the comments. Anything final, guys, before we wrap this up? No, I don't think so. Chuck? No, I'm not. It, it was a good story. Very good. All right. Well, folks, thanks for joining us. That's our Bigfoot Breakdown for this week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.